Did Jesus talk to himself? Well, another question I'd like to ask is, uh, do you talk to yourself? I'm going to do a study on this. Uh, one of the attacks of the pagan Trinitarians or Muslims or atheists is that they'll mock and they'll say, if Jesus Christ is God, he's praying to the Father. Is he praying to himself? And a Trinitarian, see a Trinitarian, if you're new to the issue here, Trinitarians believe that there are three separate people, persons, they'll say, and God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And you say, well, then you believe in three gods. No, we believe in one God, but three beings calling themselves God. You know, cuckoo. But uh, they'll, they'll do this thing, the, you know, Bible believers like myself, we believe in the biblical Godhead. The word Trinity is not a Bible word. We believe in the biblical Godhead, and the Godhead is body, soul, spirit, three different parts to one being. Okay, man is made in the image of God. I have a body, I have a soul, I have a spirit. There's three parts, but one being. Okay? And so I can look at it and I can say, all right, is Jesus, who is he praying to when he's praying to the Father? Jesus, the body, is praying to the Father, the soul. Not that hard. Okay? But a Trinitarian will come along and they will mockingly say, was Jesus praying to himself? Was he talking to himself? Was he, you know, some kind of schizophrenic type of mental disorder or whatever else? Uh, you see, they're saying that because they themselves are a self-righteous sinner. They don't understand the thing of the separation of the body of flesh and the soul and the spirit. They don't understand that because it's just the flesh that's totally in control. So they think it's crazy to talk to yourself. Yet the New Testament commands a Christian to do so. I want to show you the scripture. Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. And it's so important. If you're watching these videos, you need to get a King James Bible, a paper-based King James Bible, okay? One that's not going to have little glitches with computers or your app isn't working correctly or whatever. Get a King James Bible, a paper one. And when you watch videos like this, turn and read what I'm saying, what I'm showing you in the scriptures. Don't just say, well, I trust him. He's a... Don't dare trust me for one second. Trust the Bible. This is your, your standard and authority, not me. Right, And if you're watching anybody who's not telling you that and, and just, oh, here's what the Bible says or and whatever else, and you're not turning there and they're not telling you to turn them there or to, to, they're not telling you to turn there, say it that way, um, don't trust them. Simple as that. You can trust me because I tell you what the standard is and it's not me. Matthew chapter 26, verse 36 through 44, well, let's read here this thing that they'll bring up about Jesus praying to the Father. I'm going to show you some really interesting things here. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Hmm, we'll get back to that. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death, Tarry ye here and watch with me. Is Jesus feeling any physical pain at that time? Is he feeling the pain of being whipped and dying on the cross? No, he's not feeling any of that. What's he feeling? What's the sorrow there? It's the soul that's sorrowing. Why? Because the soul understands what's coming. Okay? Give you a little analogy of this. Um, you hear in the news that you are wanted for a very serious crime and the police are en route to your house as this report is coming out and when they get there it's a SWAT team that's going to come in and they are going to knock in your door they're going to come in and they're going to taser you with multiple tasers they're going to get you on the ground put your arms behind your back and one of the SWAT officers is going to smash your head onto the floor with his knee and another one with his knee in the middle of your back and they're going to yank your hands way up like this and handcuff you. They're going to take you out, throw you in the back of a squad car, take you to the police station. Then they're going to give you an interrogation to get the truth out of you. Well, you're not going to feel any of the physical pain from that, from just hearing that news. But your, so your soul is going to be very sorrowful. That's what's going on here. Okay? So it mentions the soul. Now look what happens. Uh, verse 39. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my father, 
If it be possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless not as I will, but as thou wilt. Mentions the soul up here in verse 38, very next verse, 39, he mentions the father. Very interesting. Verse 40, And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What, could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now you say, well, he's talking to the Peter, so he's talking to him, and he's saying, your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. Your spirit is willing to follow with me and to be with me, but I know your flesh is weak, you're falling asleep, and you're, you're you know, basically going to deny me and, and all the other things. Very true. But uh, I believe there's also some application to himself. The spirit indeed is willing. The Holy Spirit is saying, this is the plan. This is what's going to, you know, we're going to win this victory, die on the cross, the blood's going to be shed, and people can be saved, and they can come to heaven. They can have all their sins washed away. It's going to be amazing. The Spirit indeed is willing. The Spirit says, this is, this is going to be a wonderful thing to do, to die on the cross. But boy, the flesh is weak. Hey, if, uh, if it came out sometime that uh, Christianity is now illegal, and any Christian that's out there, if we catch you, we're going to put you to death, um... Would your spirit be willing to die? Well, if you're saved, yeah, it would be. Would your spirit be willing to be tortured slowly? Ew. Flesh starts to get a little weak there, doesn't it? Yes, it does. You don't want to think about it. You read some of the stories of Fox's Book of Martyrs or the Martyr's Mirror or any of the old ones like that, and you start to see how Christians were tortured horribly by the Catholic Church. And there's a, there's a somewhat of a joy there in the, in the sense of seeing how these people suffered and died for Jesus Christ and never gave in to the dictates of Rome. But boy, the flesh. You think about that and you think, wow, you know, the horrible stuff that they went through and the tortures and everything else. And you, oh, and your flesh just kind of dreads that. Uh, well, how would it be for Jesus Christ? He's innocent. You know, he's completely innocent. And he knows, I came here to die on the cross to pay for the sins of the world. Boy, that's going to be great. But to get from now till there, it's going to be bad. It's going to be a lot of pain coming. Okay? Here's the point. It's not three separate persons. And the Father's up there in heaven and some guy's sitting up there and he's going... Well, son, this is going to be rough. It's going to make a man out of you. Okay? I'm not going to feel anything. I'm, I'm, it's going to be hard to watch for me, but, uh, you know, I'm not feeling it. You know, it it's, it's your body, you know, whatever. I'm not, I don't want my body to be scarred up like that. The Holy Spirit's a little bird flying around, and he's going, you know, catch me if you can or something. You know, he's cruising around. Uh, yeah, I've always wondered what these Trinitarians, what does the body of the Holy Spirit look like? This person that's up there. Weird. Okay, uh, no. All members of the Godhead are feeling this thing in their own way. Okay? The soul was exceeding sorrowful. The Father, exceeding sorrowful and saying, oh man, this is bad. This is really, really bad. The flesh, Jesus is going, yeah, tell me about it. I'm the one that's going to feel this. And the Holy Spirit is saying, yeah, but remember what it's going to mean. Think about that. But let's continue. Uh, where are we at here? Verse 42, And he went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Okay? And again, I, got, I always got to kick this thing when I go through this passage. Watch out for people that say you can't pray and say the same words because that's vain repetition. It's not vain repetition. Vain repetition is, oh, Holy Mary, Mother of God, blessed be the fruit of the loom, you know, and all that. That's vain repetition. Okay, Just saying a prayer and you can be thinking about you know, what you're going to be eating for lunch that day or oh, should we go fishing today or maybe I should go to the races and maybe, you know, horse races and do some little gambling and it's okay, the prayer's done. Okay, now I can go. You know, that's vain repetition, right? If you say, uh, Lord, please help Uncle Bill to get saved. I really have a burden for Uncle Bill. The next day, Lord, I just really am praying for the. Well, I can't say the same things. Yes, you can. <laughs> okay. 
just had to kick that. But, you know, again, in the passage, you're seeing the Godhead. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus Christ was a body, a soul, a spirit, but he was one being walking around. Colossians 2, 9 says that. Trinitarians just can't handle that thing. They have to say, well, no, he's, he's just one of three people. The Bible plainly teaches three persons. It doesn't say anything of the kind. And these people will just, they'll just lie. Trinitarians, every Trinitarian adds to the scriptures and seals their fate. I'm not talking about people that ignorantly say Trinitarian type of terminology. I used to. A lot of people do. You just repeat things out of ignorance. I'm talking about people that know the issue and insist the Trinitarian is a fundamental doctrinal, you know, you have to believe in the Trinity to be saved. Flaming papists, every single one of them. And they will be flaming for all of eternity. Mark chapter 14, let's go there. We'll see another parallel passage to Matthew chapter 26. Mark chapter 14, verse 32. And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he saith to his disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John, and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. And saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. There's the father. His soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me, nevertheless not what I will, but thou what thou wilt. Again, he mentions the soul, and then he prays to the Father. Why? That's what he's praying to, the soul. Really not that hard to figure this stuff out. Okay? Um, verse 37, And he cometh and findeth them sleeping, and saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst not thou watch with one hour? Kind of rough thing for the Pope there, because Catholics teach that Simon Peter was the first Pope. Not a very good Pope. Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. The soul exceeding sorrowful unto death. The flesh, or excuse me, the spirit is willing. The flesh is weak. Three parts of one being. And there you go. It's not Jesus in three different modes. Or Jesus only. There is no Father. There is no Holy Spirit or something. No. Again, just to explain things. The body and the soul and the spirit can separate. That's what happens when you die. Your body goes down. Your soul and your spirit go up. Right? Body's there waiting for the catching up. Some people call it the rapture. Then the body goes up. The redemption of the purchased possession. Ephesians chapter 1 talks about it. But uh, let's continue here. Verse 39. And again he went away and prayed and spake the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Neither wist they what to answer him. And he cometh the third time, get back to that, and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. It is enough. The hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Hmm. He cometh the third time. Um, what you're going to find as you are a Bible-believing Christian, when you start to say, this is God's book right here, King James Bible, right there, God's book. I don't need Greek. I don't need Hebrew. I don't need other versions to clarify commentaries. Nope. King James Bible. When you, believe, when you come to this book believing that this is God's Word, God's perfect Word, um, the Holy Spirit will start to reveal things to you. It's amazing. And you'll find little phrases in there, and all of a sudden you think, whoa, check that out. You know, in context, he's talking about coming to his disciples the third time. But uh, some spiritual application there. Um, you know, the Bible says, you know, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So you don't just say only doctrine. No, there's some reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. And the instruction in righteousness, there is one of the big post-trib rapture arguments is they'll say, the Bible plainly says that there's only two comings of Jesus Christ. Well, here's a little nugget there. There in uh, verse 41, And he cometh the third time. I thought that was rather interesting. 
uh, I understand what the context is about, okay? But you see the little spiritual thing there. For those of us that are genuinely saved and have the Holy Spirit of God within us, we can get the Lord's little special little thing there that He puts in for those of us that believe His Word. Um, but it's interesting because in the, the, when you look at the life of Jesus, He comes three times, okay? First time is the first century. He came to His own and His own received Him not, all right? Second time, He comes for His bride before the time of Jacob's trouble. He catches up His bride, all right? Third time is Revelation 19, the second coming. They call it the second coming, the second coming for the Jewish people, all right? He's not coming back for the Jews at the rapture, you see. He comes for the church. So for the Jews, there are only two comings. For the body of Christ, there is a third that's in between the first and the second. Interesting. If you're saved, you'll get it. If you're lost, you're not getting it. Okay? You're writing right now comments about John Nelson Darby in 1830 and the Jesuits Ribeiro created the futurism in it. Okay? You know, <laughs> just go ahead. <laughs> Write that stuff. Another passage here, Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, verse 39 through 46. Another one of the parallel passages um, about the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus talking to the Father and mentioning the soul in context with the Father. Verse 39, And he came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not in, into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and saw and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow, and said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. Hmm. Have you ever really dreaded something as a Christian? You know, some kind of bad thing is coming and bad and whatever else, and you're trying to remain positive and whatever else, but you're saying to yourself, Oh, boy, this is going to be terrible. Yeah, but the, the Bible says that we're going to have to go through this. And, yeah, I know, but, oh, boy, I'm not going to do this is going to be terrible. Is there some way I can get out of this thing? And uh, I don't know. I know what the Bible says, though. This is what's supposed to happen. And, it, uh, and you're kind of going back and forth. That's normal when you're saved. Right? With Jesus, He's doing it with the Father. Okay? He's talking to the Father. Why? Because they're connected. Body. Soul. And the Spirit is saying, yeah, but this is the way things are supposed to be. John chapter 14. This is the uh, text that really separates the saved from the lost right here. Uh, lost Trinitarians will not understand this. They will go and they will spiritualize things. They will add words. They all add words to the text. They, they, you know, Trinity is not in there. And you point out and they say, yes, okay, Godhead is the Bible word for, for you know, the Trinity, they'll say. <laughs> but we'll, we're just going to continue saying the Trinity. But that's not in the Bible. They say, well, yeah, well, you, word, you use words that aren't in the Bible either. I don't use titles of God. Okay? I'm not going to call God uh, Herman or something. Well, he's never called Herman in Scripture. Yes, I know. But Herman more accurately describes who he is and his nature than does Jesus. So I'm just going to call him Herman now or something. No, uh, you don't call him by that name. And Trinity is not just a description of God. It is a, it is a title. God in three persons. Blessed Trinity. That's a title. The Most Holy Trinity. That's a title. You ought to quit using it. But this is the passage here where you can separate saved and lost. Saved people will look at this and they'll say, wow, Jesus is the Father. Lost people will look at it and they'll say, it doesn't say that. Even though it plainly does. They'll say, well, it, it means one in nature, that they're, that they're in unity, their divine essence, their, their, their uh, um, uh, yeah. Let's look at the passage here. John chapter 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Why? He's saying, believe in God. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Why? We're the same being. 
not, well, you believe in him, now you have to believe in me, too. We're two different gods. It's not what he's saying. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whether I go, ye know, uh, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way. I am is a title of God. I am that I am. From back in the book of Exodus. I am the way. The truth and the life. Three. But yet one. Jesus did not say, I am the way. The Father is the truth, and the Holy Spirit's the life, or in some other order. He didn't say that. I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Why not? If he's a separate being, or you've got to go through the Son or something to get to the Father, um, meaning that they're two different beings, or meaning that it's the body and the soul. You see? <clears throat> but here's where it gets really interesting. Verse 7. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. Hmm. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Now that right there is one of the key scriptures disproving the whole Trinity thing. Because the Bible plainly teaches that no man has seen God, meaning the Father, at any time. He's the invisible God. He's called elsewhere in scripture. In scripture. But Jesus says you've seen him. Let's continue. Verse 8. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Philip says, No, we haven't seen the Father. Where's the Father? I don't see the Father. Show us the Father, Lord. Jesus, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? I mean, it is crystal clear. Unless you're a Trinitarian. Unless you have an agenda. And that's precisely the whole thing there. They'll, they have to spiritualize, spiritualize this. They have to say, well, when he says, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father, he's saying, you know, I'm representing the Trinity on the earth, and the Father is up there in heaven representing the Trinity, and the Holy Spirit, he's just omnipresent, so he's everywhere, so he represents the Trinity. It's not what it's saying. Philip doesn't say, explain to us where the Father is or, or show us the Father. Jesus says, you've seen him. Okay, Philip says, no, we haven't. Show us the Father. Jesus says, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. You know, and I told this little, or used this little analogy in another one of my sermons. Somebody comes and they say, oh, excuse me, I'm looking for Brian Denlinger. And I say, you're looking at him. They say, oh, okay, um, where? I don't... You mean some other guy, is he in the house? Of course they're not going to say that. They're going to say, oh, okay, I'm, I'm so-and-so. I'm here to talk to you about whatever. If I say you're looking at him, you know, if you've seen me, you've seen Brian. You don't say, oh, that you're not really Brian then. Just so weird. I, I've never been able to understand. I mean, I understand that they're lost, but it just, it's so plain. Verse 10, believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? They're one being, in other words. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Hmm. Jesus, I mean, again, think about this logic. Of, if you believe in the Trinity, they're two different beings, okay? Jesus says, the words that I'm speaking, they're not my words, they're my Father's words. But they're saying, I don't, the Father's not standing here in front of us. He's up in heaven, the old guy that lives in heaven. I mean, how does it make any sense at all? Jesus says, the words that I'm speaking unto you, they're not mine, they're the Father's. We'll see it again here in a little bit. Verse 11, Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And you say, well, see, he goes unto his Father, so he's not one and the same. No, body and soul. The soul's up in heaven. Jesus is going to go back to heaven at some point in time. Verse 13, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. 
Yeah. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Okay, good uh, teaching on uh, eternal security there. The comforter, when he's given to you of the Father, he abides with you forever. Not, well, until you commit a, a mortal sin. You know, venial sins are okay, but mortal sin, you know, Catholic thing there. Uh, no, he abides with you forever. Hmm. But you say, who's this comforter? Look at uh, verse 26. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. You say, okay, well, right there it is. The comforter, you know, I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. What's the Holy Ghost? Right? Yes. But continue reading. Verse 17. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. Wait a second. The Spirit of truth? What did Jesus say up in verse 6? I am the way, the truth? You say, are you trying to tell me that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are the same? They're the same being? Well, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. Down here he says, the comforter, even the Spirit of truth truth hmm but to continue here because it seeth him uh, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not neither knoweth him verse 17 we're in but ye know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you okay ye know him again Philip just said and Jesus says you've seen the father and they say Philip says show us the father and it sufficeth us Jesus says have I long have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Then he goes on to talk about the Holy Spirit, and he says, um, Ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. You know him. You know me, don't you? Jesus is saying. I'm the one. Let me show you the proof. Verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. No, you won't. You're standing right there. What do you mean you're going to come to me? I'm going to pray the Father, and he's going to send you the Comforter. The Comforter is the Holy Ghost. But Jesus says, I'm going to come to you. That doesn't make any sense if you're a Trinitarian. If you believe in the biblical Godhead, it makes perfect sense. These three are one. Body, Jesus, soul, Father, Spirit, Holy Ghost. Verse 19. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? Um, didn't he already tell him? <laughs> must have been so frustrating for the Lord, you know. Uh, verse 16 down there, you know, he says, How is it thou, verse 22, How is it thou that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Verse 16, he said, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. You see, Jesus is saying, he's trying to explain to his disciples here, that I am the Father, I am Jesus that you're looking at here, and I am also the Holy Spirit. And they're saying, I don't get it. I don't, I don't quite understand. Could you show us the Father? How is it that you're going to manifest yourself to us and not unto the world? Jesus is probably going, I just got done saying it. <laughs> don't you get it? Verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Yeah, listen to what I'm saying in other words. Verse 24, He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which he hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Talked about that earlier. The word which ye hear is not mine. You're not listening to me right now, Jesus is saying, but the Father's which sent me. Huh? You know? And you say, they couldn't have been this dense. How is it the disciples are right there with Jesus and are just not getting it? Um, for a very simple reason. They were lost at that point in time. Doing what they should have been doing there in that 
time that they were in the Old Testament there to earn salvation, but uh, they weren't redeemed. They didn't have the Holy Spirit of God. Verse 17. He's got to come. He's got to be sent to them. They didn't have the Holy Spirit of God. They were not saved yet. Okay? In the sense like we are saved today. Uh, there was no death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ yet on the cross to pay for their sins. They weren't saved. That's why they weren't able to understand this stuff. That's why Trinitarians today don't understand this stuff. You got it? They don't get it. They're natural men. The natural men, they can't receive the things of the Spirit of God. It's foolishness to them. That's why they created this pagan thing called the Trinity. It has to add so many things to the Scriptures, thereby violating clear commands in Scriptures to not add to God's Word. Verse 25, These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, hmm, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give, uh, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Hmm. So much more I could say on that, but we're going to continue on here. Go to John 17, verse 1 through 5. And we're going to get to the thing here in a little bit. Actually, next, after we go through this passage, we're going to get to the thing where you are commanded to speak to yourself. Okay, if you don't know the scripture already, I'm going to be showing it to you as a Christian. John chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. One and the same. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. We'll get back to that. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou with thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Jesus is speaking to his Father. We can all agree to that. Okay? Now, either Jesus is speaking to another being in heaven, or he is speaking to his soul up there. Right? Here's the problem. You say, well, there are at least two persons there. The God in, God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three in one. Wow, it's beautiful. It rhymes really nice. I'm very impressed. But the whole thing is, look at the problem that you make for yourself when you're a Trinitarian. Look at verse 3. That they might know thee. Thee in your King James Bible is a reference to one. Always is. They might know thee, the only true God speaking to the Father, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. If you are a Trinitarian and you say that there are three separate persons, then you are basically saying that Jesus, not, Jesus Christ is not the only true God. Jesus says to the Father, you alone, thee, you're the only true God. And then makes distinction between him and himself and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So if you're a Trinitarian, that verse right there is saying, Jesus Christ is not the only true God. Now make up a bunch of new terms to try and rescue your sinking ship. Good ship Trinity that's, you know, disgusting. What's going on there? Jesus Christ as a body is praying to his soul in heaven. And again, I don't even understand how all that stuff works, right? The Bible teaches in the book of Ephesians that a Christian is seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. How on earth does that work? What is the spiritual connection between soul and spirit and heaven? But let me ask, the, let me, let me ask you this, if you're saved. Um, wouldn't you like to know some of what's going on in heaven? Wouldn't you like to have some spiritual connection there? where you can get some instructions from that soul that's up there in heaven to come down here to your body of flesh and help you with this mess that you are. And again, that's why Trinitarians reject this stuff, because they don't think that they are a mess. 
I'm not such a bad person. I'm not uh, convicted of these different things and whatever else. So ha ha ha, you know, those that would talk to themselves are such poor simpletons and think, uh, I don't think so. I talk to myself quite a bit. Why? Because my flesh is very wicked. That's why. And I'm constantly having to say, don't do that. Don't touch it. Turn that music off. Don't do that. And my flesh is coming back and saying, oh, come on. Just to the end of the thing. and Let's just, just bug off, buddy. Okay, I want to eat this. It tastes good. I'm going to do this thing. I don't feel like reading the Bible right now. I'm going to watch that. I'm going to do that. And my soul is saying, oh, no, you're not. There's a war. You see? When you get saved, there's a war there. Read Romans chapter 7 if you don't believe me. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death, Paul says. Yeah, you struggle as a Christian. Again, it cracks me up. These posties, they come out and they say, we just don't know what it's like to struggle down here as Christians. We're going to have to go through this final time of purification. And I'm, and I'm thinking, you don't know what it's like to struggle as a Christian? You don't, you don't, you don't oh, I guess the Catholic inquisitor, you know, inquisitors are, aren't pounding on our door, so we're not struggling or something as Christians. Uh, those of us that are truly born again, we struggle every day with the lust of the flesh. All right, We look forward to getting a body that no longer is tempted to sin. We look forward to getting away from this world. But you see, lost people, it doesn't bother them. They can go to the grocery store and hear the rock music, and it doesn't bother them. It doesn't vex them. They can hear profanity, and they, eh, I use some myself. What's the big deal? You see? There's no separation there. So to them, they cannot imagine somebody praying to themselves. Or talking with themselves. But let me show you the scripture that says that you're supposed to do it as a Christian. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14 through 20. Wherefore he sayest, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. A lot of you Trinitarians don't have that light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Not as fools. Don't act like an atheist. Okay? Don't live without any reference to God or to His Word in your life. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. There's that struggle. i got to redeem the time. There's not much time. I, I need to read my Bible. I need to try to witness to people. i got to get something done for the Lord and whatever else. Why? The days are evil. But not if you're uh, lost little professing Christian. Uh, the days aren't that evil. All things are getting kind of bad in the general sense and blah, blah. Mm -hmm. These people don't understand this stuff. Verse 17, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Get it figured out, in other words, what you're supposed to do with your life as a Christian. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And how do you do that? Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Huh. Speaking to yourselves. You say, well, but it's, it's singing. Okay. Uh, psalms there. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Um. What are you doing there when you're speaking to yourself? You're trying to overcome the flesh and put the flesh down. Hey, next time you get tempted to look at pornography online, I've said this thing for years, just start singing. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can... See how long your lust lasts. And here's another good one. Get around a bunch of people and uh, they, uh, they're walking through the grocery store and just start you know, lowly sing, speaking to yourself, you know, just start walking around going, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And watch how people react to you. Guy's crazy. This guy's over there singing songs to himself. We got a crazy one over here. Mm-hmm. Kind of like what they thought of Jesus. Jews walking by, they're going, this guy over here, he claims to be God the Father. You know, he claims to be holy, completely God over here. You know, this, this guy, listen to me. 
He's praying. He's praying to, to the Father. I thought he said he was the Father. He, he that has seen me hath seen the Father. Why is he praying to the Father? Woo! And isn't it interesting that the Trinitarians will use that same argument that lost people use? Kind of weird. Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. Went one page too far. Matthew 22, verse 37. Jesus saith unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Heart, soul, and mind are connected. Hmm. I'm going to be doing some studies on that in the future. What is the, you know, the body, the soul, the spirit? What's the relationship? How do they all work out? You know, whatever else. Very interesting subject. i got to do a lot of study on it yet, but it's, it's some interesting stuff. Mark chapter 2, Mark chapter 2 and verse 5 through 12. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Look what happens here. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. You mean there's something going on in their, in their heart and their reasoning in their heart? It's just kind of a feeling, a warm, fuzzy feel. No, it's not. Continue reading. Verse 7. Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Two sentences, reasoning it in their heart. Hmm. Verse 8, And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? They were having a conversation inside, in their soul. If you want to study it out, I mean, what we just read there in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, heart, soul, and mind, okay? They're connected, they're interconnected. And he says, Why are you reasoning these things in your hearts? They're reasoning things within their soul. Hmm. Verse 9. Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk? But the, that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy bed and go thy way unto, into, thine own, into thine house. Excuse me. And immediately he rose took up the bed and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Glorified God. Uh, that meant the Father in heaven. Or was, was it God the Father or God the Son or God the Holy Spirit that they glorified? Um, just God. Jesus. Finally, to go to Luke chapter 12. You can claim that you don't talk to yourself, and you can say, well, oh, that's for crazy people. Oh, this is funny. <laughs> um, lost people do it too. But you're just too self-righteous to admit it because you have to come into this whole thing of uh, Jesus was not really the Father. He's not really God, completely holy God. Trinitarians tear Jesus down from his position power. He's the second member of the Trinity. Uh, back in my teenage years, they used to be a bumper sticker. I was big time into dirt bikes. And it was this, you know, comp competitive mindset thing, you know, when you race. And I remember they had this bumper sticker and it said, second place is the first loser. A lot of truth in that. If you want to win, you got to get first place. Because if you get second place, you lost, technically. You know, yeah, you got second place, but you didn't get first place. Um, well, if Jesus is the second member of the Trinity, then he is the first loser. Uh, no, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He has preeminence. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. He's not the second member of anything. If you say that, you are blaspheming the Lord Jesus Christ, God Almighty. And you better repent while there's still time. Luke chapter 12, verse 16. 
We'll read this. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, This ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, hmm, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul. So when you think within yourself, you're saying to your soul? Hmm. Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Very interesting. Jesus Christ is there on earth and he can see these people that are sitting around when he's got this guy that's sick of the palsy lowered down and things and he, and he sees them reasoning within themselves. You see? In their soul. And Jesus perceives in his spirit and says, why are you reasoning these things in your hearts? Here, the rich man says to his soul, he's speaking within himself, and he says to his soul, you know, say there, uh, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. I got it made, man. I'm, I'm, I'm good. And the Lord looks down and he says, he doesn't say, I'm going to drop you there, buddy. Um, and your soul and your spirit are two different you know, beings that are someplace. He looks down and he says, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Very interesting. So, again, another little thing debunked here. It's just, it's just so sickening. You know, this whole thing of this Trinitarian stuff, it is a very covert attack on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to be showing a scripture coming up here in another video. But it's just this, all this stuff that these guys come out with, uh, with all their little twistings of scripture and whatever else to just try and tear Jesus down from being fully, completely God. It's satanic. And to mock Jesus Christ and say, well, did he, did he talk to himself? Did he pray to himself and things? Uh, yeah, he absolutely did. The body and the soul can have that, you know, communication. If you don't believe that, well, it's because you're lost. And I mean, you just, and you're covering up for the fact that you actually do. There is some communication there. But that's going to be it. Going to be doing uh, a lot more videos here. We're, we're really busy trying to, restructure things a lot of big plans it's going to be talking about in some future videos coming up but uh just want to thank everybody out there for their support your prayers and we'll see you in the next video thank you for watching